Hello. Uh, this is the um, Chapter 7 um, recorded lecture for Healthcare Analytics, HSC 400. And what we're going to look at in this chapter is really developing and using effective indicators. Now, this is a shorter chapter, but it's interesting because it is also uh, one of the most important chapters. So I find that interesting in this textbook. Understanding what, what's going on in your organization is is understanding what indicators give you the greatest information. Now, I've been in organizations that have 5,000 indicators, and they follow them, you know, all day long, and they think that that's going to really help them, and it really doesn't. What you really need is indicators that give you a good information, but tell you that something's wrong or right, so to speak, or something's going in the wrong direction, and then allow you, uh, then, then can set up a, a secondary it's investigation that says, okay, uh, these things are starting to go south. Why are they going south? And that's really the question. You, these, the indicators are really just going to tell you things are moving in one direction or the other, and that's what you want. Why they're doing that is a whole different sort of set of set of analyses. And so you want to make sure that you're you ha you're not trying to make an indicator that's going to sort of tell you how to make how to do things. It'd be great. That'd be you know it'd be automated AI kind of information. You know, you have things that says, okay, move the organization this way whenever this happens. And they don't need really need to have leadership after that, I guess. So data and HCOs, healthcare organizations. Healthcare organizations have more data than they know what to do with. And that's really true. They have more data than they can even analyze. And they collect this data uh, because they then and they treat it like gold in a gold mine. And sometimes they store it away and they don't do a darn thing with it. They don't spend it, so to speak. They have all this data, they don't use it. And so they use they have this raw data, and what happens is is they they file it away and file it away, and they never get access to it. It doesn't do a darn bit of good. So they spend all this money collecting it, all this money maintaining it, all this money um, storing it, and yet they don't get a dime back as far as useful you know useful um, of useful value. So they, it's important that they that you understand that data by itself is like you know a piece of a big old piece of gold. And if it's sitting out in the middle of the, of the of a field somewhere, it's not really very helpful. Uh, if you are able to mine that gold and then and then uh, turn it into cash, then it's pretty valuable. So that's the difference. Now, raw data is not really useful by itself, obviously. And for quality improvement, process improvement needs to be analyzed, obviously. Indicators have to be established to measure processes and financial measures and outcome measurements and quality measurements. All of these really fall under this these two groups. Now, I use process improvement a little different than quality improvement. Quality improvement tends to be more clinically focused. Process improvement tends to be non-clinically focused. And you will have QI and PI teams in many hospitals. Now, in smaller hospitals, these are all one. But the, the process improvement is really a, a way of looking at that across all, all um, industries, not just healthcare. So measures, metrics, and indicators. Measure in healthcare typically refers to a quantitative value representing some aspect of patient care. So it is a quantitative number, and we're measuring that. May or may not be linked to a specific performance and QI, PI initiatives. It usually includes variables like time, counts, and other similar data. So measurements are like, um, you know, one I like to do is how long is it from a patient who's diagnosed with having a, a uh, coronary artery blockage to getting them a stint? Uh, how long said? How long does that happen? And the 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 gold standard is less than 30 minutes, believe it or not. That once they have the chest pain, they're diagnosed with having that. They are able to get them from ER uh, into uh, Im Im uh, medical imagery and put it, have the stent put in uh, within 30 minutes. And sometimes the, the people say we'll say an hour, but you'll find that the top gold standard is really 30 minutes. And many of the top hospitals in the nation, medical centers in the nation, are able to do it in 30 minutes. Now, measures, metrics, and indicators, uh, the, the, this, this, this scale here illustrates a measure, and it's a sample graph of the number of patients that are triaged. So we know that we triage this many in this day, and uh, down the line you see this fairly, you know, probably fell for a few days here, and you kind of see that. And this is a, this information is sort of nice to know. It provides some context of the, the business of the emergency department over that time period, business with a Y. Hmm. Um, it, it doesn't, busyness, I guess. Anyway, it doesn't provide additional information, uh, any additional information about the performance of the department. So it's, it, it just really tells you it's an overall number, and that's, that's kind of important. A metric is some aspect of healthcare quality or performance to which a quantitative value is attributed for purposes of monitoring and evaluation. So a metric would be uh, patients are triaged in the emergency room within 15 minutes of arrival. That's a metric. 
and typically given a, a given point of time and a ta or time period. So I just said that a patient should be triaged in the emergency room within 50 minutes of arrival. Period. Um, and can be used uh, situationally for specific projects. So these are a way to sort of identify the standard. A good example, uh, 7.2 illustrates a metric in case of percentage of patients whose triage scores were overridden by the triage nurse from what was suggested by the computer's triage uh, algorithm. So big override here, but fell down here. So this is kind of interesting. It would be interesting to know if this was one triage nurse and all these were other triage nurses, or if this, you know, what the what the makeup is of the people doing triage. If there's one nurse that is, is sends a triage different than other people, um, it would be interesting to know that because that would that would be a, a be, that means it would be a, a person problem, not a system problem. Now, indicators is a metric which content is assigned to them, which is more useful and drives business decisions. So here we have a sample graph the indicator triage override rule. Uh, rate and the baseline and target. So what you're seeing is this is where it should be down here. Here's the tr here's the target. Here's the baseline. That means that that's where it's at the last 30 days. But we're trying to get down here. So these are our outliers here. This tells you these are way out of whack, and that most of these are okay. This one falls up a little bit, but it's probably okay. It's still with close to the baseline. But these are way out of whack, and we got to find out why that is. So the why comes into place. Indicators identify whether a performance is good or bad. I'll say a positive or negative. In terms of how far away uh, performance is from reaching its performance target, if you go back, you can see that these are way past the, the baseline or way past the target. There's the baseline of all the data. This, this is the, the baseline over 90 days. But look at this. Target is supposed to be down here, and these are way out. So you can see that that's bad. Um, and then we see, I'm sorry, go back a little more. So that uh, they also tell whether performance is trending towards meeting the target or trending away from the target. And this is interesting in that uh, this is probably trending down. But maybe that was where we first measured it, we were up, and then we made some changes to bring them back down. Maybe that's so. If no change occurred, if this is just baseline information, then we have to start finding out why these days are this way and these days are this way. Now, if this is just, uh, we, did, we put a process in place. Maybe here we put a, we put a change in place. And we started seeing this occur. Uh, then we, we have an improvement. Now, we have to develop effective key performance indicators to focus improvement efforts. And so key performance indicators, KPIs, are defined as a set of measures on those aspects of organizational performance that the organization, the HCO, finds most critical for the success, either current or future success. And there are five main characteristics of key performance indicators. They should ex be expressed in non-financial measurements. So they should be based on, on uh, not dollars. They should be measured reported frequently. This is daily. Um, to be honest with you, some performance measurements may be, have to, may be more like hourly. For instance, uh, we looked at we looked at turnaround times for beds in a hospital. We had a medical center that had over 400 beds. And yet our turnaround time was hours. And most of that was inefficiencies at multiple levels. Um, one is that the nurses on some of the units weren't very good about identifying the beds that were open because that means the new patient would have to come in and they thought they were overworked and they didn't want to fill that room. Uh, sometimes with housekeeping, uh, had have his people out to lunch uh, during a time when they really needed help, so they had all their lunches at one time, uh, which made it almost impossible to do any turnover, so they got an hour delay for lunch and dinner times. So you can see how things, those kind of things could happen. And so we started, we measured and reported frequency on an hourly basis to see what was going on. And we looked at turnover, turnover times that we tracked, literally tracked all the time. So when somebody would call for a bed, they, we would look at the patient that was discharged from the room. When they were discharged from the room, they left. So we had the leaving time. We'd identify when the, when the, uh, when, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the custodial staff was called to clean the room. And then we, we identify when they got there, when they finished the room, and when a new patient was put in. We look at those times to determine where our bottlenecks were. And this is active on by senior management and key decision makers, trust me. We changed something. They had an average of 50 beds available at one time uh, because, uh, because of all these in, in, inefficiencies. And we, cut, we, were, we were in high demand for beds. We always had people waiting in the emergency room for beds and other places. And so they would have 50 beds just kind of sitting there, in, you know, sort of molding, if you will, and we were able to minimize that effect down to where we would have 10 beds in place, so to speak, that were being cleaned and such, and they were done in a more, a more, uh, more optimal way. 
it ties responsibility for performance and action to an individual team. So we start looking at we start looking at, at units that were slow that did it slowly, units that did it faster. We started finding out what were the characteristics of the units that were able to turn a bed around fast compared to what the ones were slow. One unit we found uh, was that they had, were understaffed. So it wasn't that the nurses were, uh, I used the term lazy, it's derogatory, let's say, use that term because some people said it, were really lazy, they were just really busy. And so they may have not, they may have been busy dealing with a patient right there in front of them and they didn't have the time to call housekeeping to come clean the room. So, uh, they're, they're, and maybe part of that was they were busy and they wanted a little break or whatever. Now, developing effective key performance indicators to focus improvements efforts, we have to look at quality indicators which must follow what's called the SMART acronym. And I like this acronym because it really, uh, when you start measuring things, it should follow, each of these should be applicable to what you're measuring. It should be specific. The indicator must be clear. And measuring what is defined as acceptable ranges of targets. So you have to define what's being measured and what, whether it falls within the target ranges. And if it falls out, it should be an alert. It should be measurable. The indicator must have quantitative significance and be measured in a standardized, reproducible manner between units, between any, any, any part of the enterprise in the hospital. It must be actionable. The indicators should be able to be acted upon when and if they are not within prescribed uh, parameters. Measuring, um, measuring the number of pigeons on the roof, you know, uh, actually, we actually did that because we were concerned that they were starting to break down a roof and we measured them. And yet we could do nothing about them. <laughs> that was interesting. So we spent money, it was before my time, but we spent money uh, just having somebody up there counting pigeons uh, for a period of time. And then we said, okay, we have all these pigeons. What do you do? Well, we can't do anything about it. We can't kill the pigeons. They're, you know, you can't go up there and shoot them. You can't poison them. Uh, what are you going to do? And so they put in some. We didn't. We had everything we could have to sort of, sort of uh, convince the pigeons not to be up on a roof. Uh, but there, lo and behold, we could do nothing about it. So we spent all this money and time to do nothing. It wasn't actionable. It should be relevant. The indicators should have high significance. If you're having indicators that measure things that aren't very significant, you're wasting your time. And you'll find that that some people like to see everything all the time, and yet when you have multiple thousands of measurements, you'll lose the important ones sometimes. So it's important to do that. They should be time bound. The indicators should specify what time period is covered, and the period covered should be consistent from report to report. I can't tell you how important that is. When I was at USAFE, United States Air Force in Europe at Ramstein, and we were in the middle of Desert Storm, we were looking, and Desert Storm was over, and we were drawing down our AIRVAC personnel, the people that would AIRVAC uh, in patients that were injured out of the out of the uh, uh, theater of operations out of the war zone. Um, then we started looking how we're going to get how we're going to send them back because most of them were reservists, and they, the data would change from day to day as to how what was needed. And so we had to go down and talk about how many airvac. Uh, so we have airvac crews, for instance. So we have airvac crews. How many? What can one airvac crew do? And so what is their capacity to move patients? And so they'd find what that was. And so we say, how many, so how many patients do we have? Well, we have this many patients. So by this, you only need this many airvac crews. Why do you have five more? Well, uh, because we needed to, so they'd give you some answer. OK, so what is the, what are we not seeing? Why do you have five more? Why can't these 10 airvac crews do what 15 are doing? Well, um, because it turned out that the airvac crews wanted extra time uh, in like in sort of like Turkey to go buy stuff. That's what we were paying money for. So we said five back, obviously, and that, that's, that time bound is pretty important. Now, using indicators to guide healthcare improvement activities, indicators should always be relevant and actual. Like I said, you don't count the pigeons on the roof and then not do anything about it. They should be relevant. It should have some desire. It should have some critical effect on your organization, and they should be aligned with the goals and objectives of the healthcare organization at the process level and the strategic level. Let's talk about that. Process level. Every patient that comes. We say that every patient that comes in a hospital and is put in, in into a room will be given uh, a patient uh, bag of patient stuff, so to speak, a, a robe and those kind of things. That's a process, and we can measure that. How many patients are given that in what period of time? The strategic level, the outcome level is, is that how many patients are returned to the hospital uh, in, with, uh, with unscheduled returns to the hospital after they're discharged. That's a strategic level. That says, OK, if 10% of our patients that we discharge are returning to the hospital, that's bad. That means that we are we're discharging patients inappropriately. And then we have to start finding out where that's happening, if that's a place problem or if that's an enterprise problem. 
So aligned indicators with strategic and tactical objectives include strategic objectives at the strategic level, analytics or metrics, indicators and targets at the tactical level is tactical objectives. Think about that as process measurements. And also the voice of the customer. That is, are we meeting the customer satisfaction that we're supposed to be doing? That's very important. Customer satisfaction is extremely important in the, in the delivery of healthcare. Now, strategic goals are quality goals and objectives that are attached to the strategic plan. Every few years, an organization should produce a strategic plan that says, this is, our, this is where we're headed. We're headed towards this area, this, this is our goal. And that everything you do should be focused on going in that direction. And that those are goals for the entire organization. They're based on best practices, evidence-based practice. And they're often reported in dashboards and routine reports to see if we're on track. Tactical goals are based on the needs of specific quality improvement and process improvement activities. And these, I can't say this enough, should support, support the strategic goals in their strategic plan. And they're often are the action elements of strategic goals. So these tactical goals are the underpinnings of what helps support the strategic goal. Let's say, okay, the strategic goal is we want to have patients out of the emergency room within one hour. So what's, what's the process? Well, we have to get them uh, registered. We have to get them triage. We have to get them seen by the nurse, the doctor. We have to get them. Uh, we have to get them discharged. So there's five steps we have to take. So we have to find out which of those. We have to look at all those five steps to gain that one hour. And the tactical goals may each be one of those five steps. Their strategic goal may be getting the patients out in an hour. So that's the that's the way you look at that. Now here's a hierarchy of strategic level indicators and tactical level indicators, and what are called sub indicators. So the strategic level is the indicator we're measuring, and those other things we talked about, the five steps in getting patients out in an hour. This is getting patients out in an hour. Uh, this is some of the steps we need, or the people that are involved in those needs to get them out within the hour. Now you have to select appropriate indicators. The indicators should report on processes that have strategic priority. I can't say it enough. Measuring you know, insignificant sort of things like the pitches on the roof is not really helpful. Using too many indicators will often confuse the decision-making process because they'll get sort of, sort of like being inundated with water versus seeing one drop of water. Remember that there's no such thing as one uh, panacea indicator. That means panacea means it fixes everything. There's no one indicator that fixes everything, uh, and that and it tells you everything. So you have to have lots of different indicators, or you have to, different indicators, but they have to be dynamic and they have to be uh, they have to be um, uh, significant and relevant. And so we'll talk. That, that shows you that. Here's some selected pr appropriate indicators. The outcome. An outcome indicator is what happens after you've done everything. It measures the overall system performance, includes the voice of the patient or customer, and the results of improvement initiatives. Did you have quality care in our hospital? And yes. What was the qual what were the quality elements? Uh, the food was good. Uh, the lab was really nice to me. Nurses were nice, but the doctors were mean. Okay. So that tells you, for instance, unplanned emergency visits, percentage of patients experiencing adverse outcomes. That's the outcomes. The process measurements are sort of tactical. They measure how well key components, like those five steps, get a patient out of the emergency room, processes and workflow steps are performed. The percentage of patients, for example, that receive uh, RTPA within the appropriate uh, window, percent of patients with chest pain having EKGs taken and read within 10 minutes of arrival. That's pretty important. That's a process measurement. Then balancing provides a look at the system as a whole. Uh, as a process and, out, and, and outcomes is improved and may help identify unintended consequences. So changes to staff workload or improvements are implemented, staff satisfaction. So balancing means <coughs> we had that one unit I talked about earlier where the nurses weren't uh, turning the beds over fast enough, but they were so understaffed that we were able to fix that by staffing them correctly and appropriately. What had happened is their department or their um, their unit manager decided she was going to save some money by decreasing the uh, number of nurses on each each in each uh, uh, each shift excuse me <coughs> each shift well that didn't work out very well it was sort of a penny wise and pound foolish kind of problem and uh, that manager didn't last very long over time because uh, her, her approach wasn't very good so process versus outcome indicators, process indicators, they measure low-level action steps that are within in, in the process or, pro, or project, um, like we talked about. Outcome indicators measure high-level results of what happened after the function, project, or process has been completed. So these are the next step out. 
Now, selected indicators. They should include indicators from all three categories, and they ensure a broader approach to oversight. They should have all of that. And we said the indicators that we talked about are outcome, process, and balancing. And so you should make sure you have all three of those indicators involved. And they help you give, they should ensure a broader approach to the oversight of the healthcare organization. This completes our chapter. Thank you very much.